So I am a neuroscientist who studies the adolescent brain. And my program of research is really um, aimed at accomplishing two goals. The first is to identify whether changes, normal changes that happen in the brain, um, can tell us a little bit about characteristic adolescent behavior, or behaviors that begin to emerge as people hit puberty. These include um, increases in exploratory behavior, um, greater interest or affinity for social groups and peers, and the increasing desire to be um, valued, respected, and admired. Um, the second goal of my research is to identify how experiences that people have during this period of life set the stage for the final phase of uh, maturation that happens in the brain up until about the mid-20s. Um, we know from a lot of research in early uh, childhood that um, there are vast changes in brain development, both in terms of how the brain functions and in terms of size and, and, and different um, reorganization of the brain. And most of these um, brain developmental changes that happen in the first few years of life support core developmental milestones. So learning to walk or learning to talk or bonding with a caregiver. All of these are supported by changes in, in how the brain functions. And indeed, in the first few years of life, the primary social input comes from the primary caregiver. Often the mother, but whichever, whomever um, is the primary caregiver also has the same uh, important um, input into, into the developing brain. But as people become adolescents, um, there's a shift, um, not just in how their brain functions, but in what their brain responds to, in what the brain is paying attention to. And the reason for that is because there are significant changes in what's called commonly the social brain. And the social brain is um, populated by different brain regions that each kind of take on a different task, whether that's recognizing faces, so the structural configuration of a face, um, whether that is reading others, uh, understanding other people's intents or emotions. All of that happens, and there's a significant increase in the, these abilities during adolescence because of changes in the social brain. Now, changes in the, in the social brain also have a lot to do with um, what we're discussing today, the increased need and desire to be valued, respected, and admired. And in part, that's because there are greater connections between the social brain and regions of what's called the prefrontal cortex, which helps us think about the future, think about our own sense of self within the context of others. So identity development and awareness of social status really changes during adolescence. Um, there is um, a greater attention to supportive relationships or where we can find support from others. The recognition of being respected and valued. Um, and as we just heard from our panel, the increased need to belong really um, is present all, at all stages of life, earlier than adolescence and of course later than adolescence, but it's perhaps the time when people first start to recognize their need to belong and recognize how it feels to not belong and the implications of that. Um, I'll briefly say, uh, I don't have that much time, but I, um, I've been saying the word adolescence, but what do I need from a neurobiological perspective? Well, adolescence is more than just um, something we, or a group of people we identify by age or grade or pubertal status. Adolescence is really broad and diverse. This um, graph here shows um, how uh, there are some age uh, overlaps between what we call early adolescence and late adolescence. Um, but during this transitional time of development, um, we can't really put one number to one particular cognitive ability or, um, or skill building. What adolescence is, and this is a definition that um, I, I came up with along with colleagues at the Center for the Developing Adolescent, um, is that adolescence is a normal, adaptive period of development that is very similar to early childhood in terms of having brain changes support those developmental milestones that are relevant for that developmental stage of life. And that set the stage for further um, development and potential. It's also a time when individuals begin to engage um, and seek out uh, activities that they find meaningful, when they take on causes that they believe in, whether it's um, climate change or education or, or racism, um, they begin to have a sense of identity um, and, and, um, and, and agency because of their ability to really more appreciate the changes that are happening, um, not just today, but how they impact later, um, later uh, development.
these are just images of some recent um, young people who've been in the news for the, really their advocacy and really important work. I want to touch on a few caveats and considerations that I think um, neuroscience really needs to be more mindful of. It, maybe it's relevant to our conversation here today. The first is that there's extensive variability in adolescents, among adolescents. So a um, little pop quiz. How old are these kids, and in what grade are they? They're all the same age and the same grade. Sixth grade. How old are they? Freshmen. Beautiful, beautiful variation in responses reflects the variation in what these people look like. So these kids are all uh, 14 and in eighth grade. And I put this, this um, picture up because they, it highlights, do I have a pointer? Yeah. Uh, for example, these two kids, it's shocking to me that they're the same age and the same grade, right? So when we lump adolescents together, we're, gonna, we're saying we should treat these kids the same. Right? That we should have the same expectations of what their needs and wants and, and, and developmental milestones are. But based purely, and not to diminish the physical, but the purely physical attributes, um, they may be having a very different experience. Right? Um, the second is that adolescence itself may be transforming. And in this age, it seems to be undergoing a vast shift in the activities that adolescents engage in. So this is a graph from a study published a few years ago, a sample of over 8 million youth. And um, they've been followed since 1976. And the question is simple, which is uh, represented on the y-axis. Uh, let me know if you, say, say yes if you um, engage in these behaviors. The behaviors are have a driver's license, experiment with alcohol, um, date, or work for pay. And the numbers were pretty steady up until the mid-90s. And then they started to drop precipitously. In terms of those who endorse dating, driving, um, trying alcohol, and working for pay. Now, we can have a long discussion about what may explain these, um, these changes. But it's important to think about how adolescents are spending their time and how they are seeking out autonomy and agency and um, engaging in, in activities that help them um, become more independent from caregivers. And finally, it's important to know um, where these data come from. Adolescent neuroscience research is really localized to a particular part of the world. So about 25% of the world's population is between the ages of 10 and 24, roughly. Nine-tenths of these young people live in low, low and middle-income countries. And yet, 90% of the current data about adolescents comes from high-income countries. And so everything I say, of course, is to be taken with a grain of salt. We're, we're examining a small portion of, of young people, um, and even smaller if we, if we are looking at their brain and examining them from a neuroscience perspective. OK. Um, so why is adolescence important? Uh, for a lot of reasons, and I think I don't need to convince this crowd about why adolescence is important. But a few things that make it particularly unique is that it's highly sensitive to the environment. And as we heard um, in the previous panel, the environment has a lot to do with what people do with their time, with how they learn and what they learn about. Um, and um, this makes the adolescent brain highly adaptive to changes. Uh, sorry, the ability to change based on, on changing um, social landscapes. The adaptability, heterogeneity, and plasticity of the brain, so plasticity meaning um, the ability to uh, change in response to environmental input, both positive and negative environmental input, um, these factors generate opportunities for adolescents to thrive. That rather than thinking about plasticity of the adolescent brain as a pathology or something, a negative attribute, um, the field in neuroscience, thankfully, is really shifting the narrative to really appreciate how important this is for helping adolescents thrive. Um, there are two major developmental milestones that occur during adolescence that are relevant here, in addition to changes in the social brain. One is that there is a strengthening of connections. So when you hear that the adolescent brain keeps developing until the mid-20s, we don't mean that it keeps expanding or getting bigger like it does in early childhood. Um, actually, the size of the brain is pretty much complete by about age five. 
Um, but what changes are the connections between different brain regions, how different uh, regions and, and um, centers of the brain communicate with one another. They become more efficient. So in early life, maybe you might think of um, the, the connections between two brain regions as a dirt road. And then as people get older and acquire experience and, and have their own individual experiences, um, that dirt road gets paved and becomes a highway and becomes more efficient and quicker to, um, to respond to the environment. The other thing that changes, the other a major change, is in um, what's called the motivation circuit of the brain. So these are brain regions. Um, the labels of these brain regions obviously don't matter here. Um, but they're brain regions that are both in the prefrontal cortex, but then also in deeper layers of the brain that respond to motivation, that are triggered when we are engaged in something that motivates us whether that be a uh, reward, like chocolate, or whether that's a social cause that we care a lot about, whether that's a healthy relationship. All of those motivations um, engage the same circuitry. And, during, and across everybody, children, adolescents, adults. But in adolescents, these are hypersensitized. So the very same really positive social relationship may have a greater um, level of excitability in these brain regions than it will later in life. Um, so I'll skip that. Um, so just to sum up, um, the heightened sensitivity in the adolescent brain, in the motivation systems, in our emotion processing systems, um, used to be considered a pathology, that that's why adolescents make poor choices or engage in risk and health compromising risky choices. But it's important to think about how they confer learning benefits for the individual, particularly in social uh, emotional domains, and how they help the adolescent explore new environments. And by the way, this isn't just the case in uh, human species. In all species that have been examined, the juvenile period, that is the period right after puberty, um, the individuals of that species engage in these same behaviors. They're more likely to affiliate and hang out and play with peers. They're more likely to explore new food sources or mating, uh, mating uh, uh, engaging with potential mates. And so this isn't specific to humans. It's a naturally um, uh, occurring a uh, normal part of development that's both influenced by biology but also by environmental context. Thank you all for listening.